Hello. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, session of the Disruptive Innovation Festival 2015. This is the first that uh, we have participated in both as a pioneer university, that's Arizona State University, and uh, with my uh, collaborator here, John Trujillo, uh, as a region, uh, the city of Phoenix, uh, represented by the city of Phoenix. Uh, we're actually the first uh, combined region and um, pioneer university in the Circular Economy 100 of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which we're very uh, excited about. Uh, today we are going to uh, tell you about the program uh, that was initiated by the city of Phoenix uh, to um, deal with diversion and ultimately circular economy initiatives and how ASU got involved in that process uh, and how our uh, collaboration has evolved and the kind of work we're doing. Uh, this is a subject uh, that um, John and I are very enthusiastic mm -hmm. about. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to see if we can keep it uh, informative and not salesy. We have a tendency to get uh, very excited about what we're doing. Uh, we've uh, done presentations like this to inform the community many, many times. Um, uh, but what we really want to lay out is uh, discuss one region's approach uh, to circular economy work uh, through the collaboration of a city and a university and a lot of other players that we have the convening power to bring to the table to do collaborative work. So uh, first let me introduce myself and then I'll let John introduce himself and begin uh, with uh, the basics of the program, how the whole thing uh, began uh, through the program uh, that is called Reimagine Phoenix. So my name is Dan O'Neill. I'll tell you a little bit more about Arizona State University and the work I do in it later in the presentation. Uh, but my uh, title is General Manager of the Global Sustainability Solutions Services. Uh, and we are a consulting unit, or a, really a solutions unit, inside of the university whose uh, uh, purpose is to deliver solutions to clients in the greater society. Uh, and again, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later in the presentation. But with that, uh, let me turn it over to my good friend and collaborator, John Trujillo, to tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you, Dan. Uh, again, as Dan mentioned, my name is John Trujillo. Currently, I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Phoenix, and in Public Works, and what we do there is we manage fleet maintenance, facility maintenance, and what we're going to talk about today is garbage and recycling. We're also going to be talking about a program, as Dan mentioned, uh, Reimagine Phoenix, and I'll talk more about that uh, during our presentation, what that really means. And uh, we'll talk about our collaboration again and, and why this is important for the City of Phoenix, and as well as the region. So with that, I guess we can get started yeah, let's, then. let's jump on into it. Well, we'll get started with our presentation. So to talk a little bit about the city of Phoenix and reimagined Phoenix, um, we, we are really, the city of Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the nation, um, where we have a regional population uh, throughout this region is about 3.3 million people. And we are projected to, to um, over, double in population by the year 2050. So this program that we're going to be talking about is, is to start working on our program now so we don't have to deal with the issues in the future, as well as, as our future generations don't have to deal with our garbage and recycling problem. So that's why I'll just give you some top context about the city of Phoenix. And, and again, we are, some people don't realize it, but we are a large city in the, in the United States. Um, to talk a little bit about our program, our, our, our garbage and recycling program, just to give you in context what we do here. So within our program for garbage and recycling, we deal with mainly residential only. And so with that, we travel over 7 million miles every year collecting garbage and recycling from our residents. And as you can see, you can go to the moon and back 14 times. And we manage over a million tons of trash that we send to the landfill every year. And again, as you can see on the screen there, Chase Field, which is our professional baseball team, we can fill that stadium seven times. So again, there's a large amount of garbage and recycling that we manage just with our residential program. And we're only 20% of the regional material 
in that that is uh, landfilled or recycled here. So as you can see, we're about one fifth of that. So John, it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of close to six million tons, right? That the, is landfilled from all sectors, all cities, all you know, private, public, across the board in the valley. That, that's correct, and that that includes everything. The six million tons. So we're about a million of that six million. <clears throat> So with that, again, it, and a lot of you know this, but our, our, our current structure here in the city of Phoenix is, is basically we dig things out of the ground, we, we take them, and we turn them into products that last for minutes to a few years at the most. And, and then what we do is we take those things that we, we made and, and we collect them and then we discard them in our landfill. And so where, we, where, again, as we talk to people, things just don't go away because we monitor and maintain environmental systems uh, for decades just because of the garbage that was thrown away. And so we want to, and because of that, we, our, our mayor and council uh, gave us a challenge to create a more sustainable solid waste program. And so they asked us, you know, let's, let's divert more from the landfill by the year 2020. So the mayor challenged us to, to divert 40% uh, of our material that goes from the landfill by the year 2020. And uh, currently we're at 20%. When we started this Reimagined Phoenix program, we were at 16%. So we've increased uh, about 25% since that time in over two years. And so we are starting to move the needle and we are working on a goal um, to change that as well. And then our goal here is to create this circular economy and so we would like to change that and, and keep resources in use for as long as possible by extracting the maximum value from, from that material and then recover, regenerate products and materials locally. And I'll talk a little more about how we plan on doing that. And again, our goal is to prevent the discarding of material from the landfill and to really focus on reuse. And that's you know what we're, we're here to talk about today is this circular economy that, that we want to create here in this City of Phoenix, as well as the region, as, as part of our goal. So, how are we doing that? And so, we're going to be leveraging partnerships, uh, technology, a lot of come up with some innovative ideas, and we've got other strategies that will create the sustainable solid waste program that the mayor and our council have challenged us to do. And so, we're looking at enhancing our solid waste programs that we currently have in place. Um, we also are trying to be more efficient, uh, have a more efficient use of our existing infrastructure. And I'll talk about how we're going to do that. We have a lot of infrastructure here in the city of Phoenix um, where we have two transfer stations, we have one landfill, and we have five closed landfills. And we have a lot of vacant land that we're going to take um, and uh, we're going to use it as to the best that we can and be more efficient and effective with our program. And again, with our partnerships that we want to create, we're going to we've, we're going to want to create a forum that will connect with innovators and organizations that are that are like-minded as us. And then also, we want to create, implement, and enhance sustainable solutions as part of our process. John, could you could you talk a, a little bit about the enhancing the solid waste programs? The uh, two or three things that uh, you're really focusing on that have already helped to increase diversion some. There's several things that we've done. What we've done is we've, we've created a, a curbside green organics program. And, and the reason we, we did that is when we did the analysis of what residents are throwing away, 30% uh, is green organics and 15% is food organics. So there's, there's almost 45% of compostable material that's being thrown away by our residents. So we, we are starting off with a green organics and eventually we'll be adding food organics to that program in the future. The other item we, we've added is we're trying to incentivize residents to throw away less and recycle more. So we're giving them options of different size containers and, and reducing the cost associated with the reduction of those containers. So we call that save as you reduce and recycle. And a lot of people are know it as pay as you throw. And so we just wanted to, to change that a little bit 
And that's what we're doing with some existing programs. And there's a third program that I'm going to talk about, composting, because of compostable. But I'll talk more about that later in, in our presentation. And then you, you always say on an ongoing, ongoing basis, communication, outreach, education programs to, to get people to use this infrastructure more effectively and properly as well. Yes, and, that, and, that, that's, what, and that's what we're going to expand upon, our current education and communication program. And that's where this collaboration comes in and partnership, because we can't communicate and educate on, on our own. And that's where we need others to help us communicate and educate the importance of our minimizing impact on our natural resources by trying to throw away less so we don't have to landfill. We don't have to transport all this material to landfill and bury it. And so as you can see here, we have several partnerships that we've created to help us with that education and communication as well as, well as, as to come up with some solutions. And so there, there's one partnership that that's very important to us uh, to get to that 40% and eventually get to that zero waste goal by the year 2050. So um, we came to ASU about three, two and a half two years, years ago, ago yeah. to talk about how we can partner to help us come up with a way and solutions to, to divert material from the landfill. That's what we originally started off with. Yeah, so, so John came to us, uh, uh, like he says, almost three years ago uh, with uh, uh, his strategic uh, this, uh, action plan for waste diversion. The waste diversion uh, strategic action plan, and it had in it uh, a number of near-term, uh, mid-term, and longer-term activities. Uh, John's already explained some of the near-term activities that they've taken on. Uh, and um, one of the mid-term to longer-term activities was uh, a request to ASU to create a center of excellence in waste management in, inside of the university and begin doing research, development, education, and solutions work in the area of uh, sustainable material management. Uh, and so uh, we conceptual reconceptualize that as an entity that we call the Resource Innovation and Solutions Network, which I will refer to uh, from now on as uh, RISM. Uh, it is a platform for facilitation, for convening, facilitating, and collaborating around resource efficiency and resource effectiveness uh, applications or, or challenges. Um, as we uh, worked over the last three years, we've evolved uh, the purpose of this entity, Risen, to, um, to address, uh, to, to be a platform for implementing the circular economy here in Phoenix as well as other places around the, the globe. So one of the things we've set out to do is to try to connect with other like-minded um, academics, practitioners, public sector, private sector folks around the world to create additional hubs uh, that will do the same kind of work that we're doing and that are committed to sharing knowledge and best practices, uh, sharing what works uh, in their particular area and so on. Uh, and so we're both uh, uh, focused in doing as good a job here in the city of Phoenix or the, really the, the greater Phoenix area uh, in, in a, from a regional approach of addressing uh, sustainable material management, circular economy, waste management challenges, as well as other resource uh, uh, challenges. And we're uh, simultaneously trying to um, spread that out uh, across the globe. I'll talk about that towards the uh, towards the end of the presentation. So, you know, this uh, took about a year to what, a year and a half, actually about a year and a half to go through the planning process of what this entity would do, but also to get through the intergovernmental agreement process. Uh, so that's a city process and the university process. Those processes take a little while. We actually signed an intergovernmental agreement, an IGA, uh, July, uh, basically ju the beginning of fiscal year last year. So we actually been doing project work um, for about the last 16 months. Um, in During that planning period, I should say that we ran a number of what has become one of our real strengths, which is region-wide collaborative uh, workshops uh, as part of the planning process. And in those planning processes, uh, we've engaged, I think it was 22 cities, uh, two counties, the EPA, uh, Maricopa County, Environmental Services, uh, in, in, Department of Environmental Quality, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, and we've talked to, I don't know, how many corporations have we 
mid part of the process, 100 maybe, that, that mm -hmm. it ranged from the largest players in the Valley to uh, small startups that are bringing different kinds of technology solutions to the, to the uh, table. So it's uh, what we were able to do because of the size of the city of Phoenix in the Valley and because of the size of ASU, uh, we're kind of the two big uh, gorillas in the Valley, I guess, and uh, we have some convening power. So we've been able to bring all those players to the table to define problems, uh, propose solutions, and to actually create collaborative projects here in the Valley. We'll talk about a few of those. In that 18-month uh, period or 16-month period of time or so, uh, we initiated about 10 or 12 projects. Uh, some of them are complete, others are ongoing, and again, we'll tell you um, about, a, about a few of those. Um, but before I do that, I will tell you just a little bit more about Arizona State University for uh, those in our global uh, audience who uh, don't know that much about Arizona State. Uh, ASU is the largest uh, university under a single administration. Um, it's all located in Arizona except for an online presence that is more global in nature. We have 83,000 students. Uh, that was last year's number. I think it's probably up to about 85,000. Uh, we have maybe about 3,000 faculty, uh, uh, more than that in staff. Uh, and that is 17 major academic units uh, that are spread out across uh, four campuses in the Valley. Um, uh, and the Global Institute of Sustainability, you're seeing the headquarters there for the Julie and Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability, uh, is a coordinating function for sustainability research, education, and practices, as well as research and development, technology development, and, tra and technology transfer. There's about 360 of those faculty members have been designated sustainability scientists and scholars. Uh, they do their research, education, and practice in areas of sustainability across the sustainability map. Everything from humanities to business to engineering to art to public programs, public policy, uh, it, they come from all of these major academic units. Uh, and what's uh, interesting for us about that is that we can draw on those faculty that are interested in doing solutions work from all these different disciplines and build uh, transdisciplinary teams to uh, focus on uh, the wicked problems of sustainability. Um, I work in a unit within the Global Institute of Sustainability that's called the Walton Sustainability Solutions Initiatives. Um, I am the general manager, as I mentioned, of the Global Sustainability Solutions Services. We try to create customized and actionable solutions to local and global challenges for a wide variety of stakeholders in the society by using uh, the 300 sustainability scientists and scholars as well as students that are interested in doing this kind of work. In the last uh, three years since the program began, a little over three years, We've done uh, in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 projects across the sustainability map, everything from greenhouse gas emissions inventories to waste management challenges to product innovation. Um, and we've done that in uh, several countries and areas around the, around the globe. We've engaged uh, uh, over 60 faculty in these processes and provided experience to a couple hundred students. Um, so uh, that's in our first three years of work. We're very excited about it. Um, and uh, we continue trying to grow the practice both here locally as well as, uh, as internationally. Um, so, in creating this uh, thing we call RISEN, uh, we, have, we, we gave it a mission ultimately uh, to accelerate the global transition to a circular economy. Uh, and to do that through this global network of public, private, and NGO uh, partners using the tools of the academic environment to help uh, the society uh, uh, create economic value and uh, um, through sustainable resource management. Uh, through this process, we got engaged with a number of people who are a number of organizations that are um, uh, part of the circular economy ecosystem, including the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, together, we decided that uh, City of Phoenix and ASU would apply to become members of the CE100. Um, I th it, we signed the contract as a pioneer university, I think, in August of this year or September of this year, and uh, your city council. We approved it. You approved it in September, September. right? Correct. Right. 
So we're now both uh, off and running with uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation and, and doing this work, as well as a number of other players in that ecosystem, including the Closed Loop Fund, the Racy Anderson Foundation, uh, and many, many others that are focused on this kind of work. So this is our tool or our platform for uh, uh, work locally as well as uh, globally uh, to focus on circular economy, sustainable resource management, um, and resource uh, effectiveness applications. Um, so uh, one of the things that the Risen will do, uh, and John will talk about this a, a little bit uh, in, in the next few slides, I think, uh, is uh, to help the city of Phoenix create a technology solutions incubator. Both ASU and city of Phoenix have quite a bit of experience in running different kinds of innovation and entrepreneurial support platforms. Uh, ranging from student uh, entrepreneurship, faculty entrepreneurship, community entrepreneurship, in a wide variety of sectors. Um, and uh, we're going to create a very focused specialty incubator uh, that is focused on doing physical things with physical resources. Uh, and uh, that's going to be housed on a campus that John will tell you more about in uh, uh, just a moment. This technology solutions incubator is going to be housed uh, on a campus uh, where there's a building that will uh, house the RISEN headquarters and the technology incubator. So as, as Dan mentioned, uh, RISEN, which is ASU, partnership with ASU and City of Phoenix, and what, and what Dan did mention and what we probably should mention here that uh, we are serious about this program, that we're investing over $3 million, both of us, uh, total um, and make getting this program up and running and making it a regional collaboration amongst other cities through this region. Yeah, and, and we're using that three million to attract other funding Correct. as well, you know, from other cities, corporations, and so on. And as you see here, is uh, this is a, a conceptual design of our Risen headquarters as well as our our incubator facility that uh, we used a class here at ASU to come up with some concepts using the Living Building Challenge and what could we do on this campus that I'll be talking about and how we can make this more of a living, breathing facility and using it as a showcase on how we here in the city of Phoenix can be sustainable and as well as incubate new ideas uh, around resource challenges. And so this is something that um, we're looking forward to. We're under conceptual design now and we're hoping to possibly start construction in 2017. As part of that process, and then, and then so earlier this year, uh, we issued what we called a reimagined Phoenix call for innovators. And so the CFI requested information that would allow the city to identify the highest and best uses for the materials deposited by our Phoenix residents in their trash and recycling bins. And to understand those business proper opportunities that would create local economic activity from those materials. And so as you can see from the screen, we received 118 responses from 75 different organizations. And so there is interest on taking our garbage and recycling and creating something from it. And so we identified these several business opportunities to be offered as RFPs that will support the creation of Phoenix's circular economy that will be seeking one or more partners to reuse, remanufacture, or repurpose diverted materials into new products. And so each one of these could become one or more new businesses that not only diverts material from the landfill, but also creates new jobs and creates economic development here in the city of Phoenix, and as well as, as we talked about, this circular economy. And so with that, as you see on the screen here, from the previous slide, all those uh, potential business opportunities in red is approximately 50 acres that we're going to take and repurpose that vacant land and utilize it for those businesses and manufacturers that want to co-locate on site with our transfer station recycling facility. Also in blue is will be our composting facility that is currently under design and will be in operation the fall of 2016. You might mention the dimension of that uh, that facility, how much material it can handle in phase one and potentially in a second phase. 
the, the comp, as Don mentioned, we do have a phase one, phase two for this composting facility. So phase one, we will be able to uh, produce about 110,000 tons of composting material. And if needed, we can construct an additional phase that will allow 220,000 tons of compostable material that can be produced from this facility. And it's about 35 acres that we're going to be utilizing for composting. And, and uh, so th th this will be pertinent to when we talk about a couple of the projects that we're going to talk about and, and how important it is to feed this facility and to have market offtake for the material coming out of the facility and to address the whole value network of the compost world. Yes, and then and, and earlier I mentioned as part of our study, residential garbage and recycling, that over 50% is compostable material. So that's why this facility is going to be important to help us divert more. And as I mentioned earlier, more efficient, effective use of our infrastructure. And this is a good example of that. So this facility here, as you can see, will have several components. And so we'll have a transfer station, which is currently on site. A recycling facility was currently there. We'll be locating this uh, composting facility. We will have businesses and manufacturers on this site. And we will have the headquarters of our RISEN facility, as well as our technology incubator will also be located all on this one site here. It's, so one of the things that uh, we've done from the very beginning is, is talk about this and position this as an economic development effort, which is very much in line with the work that uh, El MacArthur Foundation and other players in the space are, are doing. We really see this as an opportunity to create new jobs, new revenues, new technologies, new business models, and do it in a kind of integrated uh, value network kind of approach here on this on this campus. Yes, and also a part of this campus, and we have um, getting ready to select three artists, but we're going to create an artist in residency program where artists will be digging through our garbage and recycling material and create art from it. And so we're doing a pilot to see how well that works. And then if that goes well, we will we'll incorporate that program into this campus. And our idea of this campus is not to be an industrial site. It's really to be an, it, part of our education and communication for our residents on what we can do and how we can divert more. And we want to be able to invite residents and other businesses and other people to this site to see what can be done and what the importance is of minimizing impact we have on our natural resources by diverting more. So uh, um, I, I will turn to uh, one of the projects as an illustration of the kind of work that we've done that kind of ties in with everything we've talked about uh, so far. Um, it's uh, become kind of our signature project in the first uh, 16 months, and that's uh, we're um, uh, have convened a number of the uh, public uh, waste haulers around the valley um, and uh, other uh, private players, uh, counties, uh, Indian tribes, uh, to co-fund a project to develop a Phoenix metro area-wide design for uh, an organics capture system, beginning with green organics and close behind that with uh, food resources or food scraps. And so this uh, program, uh, it took about six months to form up. It began uh, uh, in mid-summer of this year, and it will be ongoing for uh, a little less than a year to produce that design. Um, and again, I said it's, it's actually uh, City of Phoenix provided some base funding for it. Uh, the Walton Initiatives, or ASU, provided some base funding for it. But it's uh, co-funded by six other cities, two counties, and a um, tribe with uh, lots of other players uh, assisting and watching and uh, ready to jump in and fund as well in both the public and private uh, sector. So the whole idea of this is to take a look at the organics profile of the valley and see what's possible if we were to take a region-wide approach uh, to collect this material in such a way that it uh, could be uh, uh, repurposed in a circular economy uh, manner. So we'll be taking a, a look uh, at um, uh, the input process output uh, kind of approach and laying, uh, a, a building uh, a visioning uh, scenario uh, capability that will allow us to look at uh, different uh, sources, different uh, processing types and different markets and how we might distribute those 
uh, on a geospatially explicit manner across the valley to get the highest and best use out of organic materials. Again, beginning with green organics, uh, closely followed by food waste, but also other uh, types of waste uh, that can go or resources that can go into, uh, into this process. Uh, with the uh, outputs being things, of course, like food reuse, compost, uh, in particular, uh, compressed natural gas is something of high value in the valley because uh, the city of Phoenix has the largest alternative fuel fleet in the nation, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, fuels are, are an important uh, part. So uh, we're in the process of, of uh, uh, data collection and now launching into a design process to take a look at, um, uh, to take a look at how we might build the most flexible, efficient uh, system that is also open to future technology innovation. Um, and uh, then I just want to mention a uh, uh, one that, um, uh, a, an add-on to that project that we just kind of initiated, I find it really uh, uh, fascinating, uh, as a prelude to um, the Disruptive Innovation Festival, we conducted a session at the a complexity conference that ASU hosted that was attended by 800 complexity uh, academics from around the world. And uh, we facilitated a session that included a number of those academics plus I think 35 practitioners from all across the value network. And we uh, asked the question, uh, what would a, a closed loop sustainable food system in the Phoenix area look like? Uh, and we did a number of um, uh, modeling exercises during that session. And uh, this is uh, an example of the stakeholder network uh, uh, modeling that came out of that, one of the things we did. Uh, and I, I show this uh, for two, two reasons. One is that an important part of the organics system is um, the use of a variety of products, you know, beneficial use of variety of product, uh, products, including very importantly compost. And, and we want that compost to be able to go to a variety of different uses. One of the projects we're currently doing is a study of the efficacy uh, of the application of compost to public parks. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've designed a two-year study, three-year study that we're doing with the city of Phoenix where we're applying compost as we speak to turf. Uh, to uh, grow better, better uh, uh, parks, save water, sequester carbon, and uh, save money. Uh, those are look, uh, and we're doing an efficacy study to see what the results of those are. And, but another place that compost can go, especially if you can have a certified, certified organic compost, is into the food system, uh, and in particular to the local slow or organic food system. The other reason why, so we're just beginning to think about that project and uh, are thinking about how we follow up this session with our next project, which would be some kind of dem demonstration of uh, uh, urban agriculture. Um, it's possible that we might even put an agricultural uh, demonstration plot on the same campus that you just uh, saw. We're looking at a number of different options. The second reason why I show this is uh, what I th something that I think is very fascinating. Um, that uh, you see the biggest player in this network of stakeholders, uh, which is the waste haulers, uh, the city municipal solid waste and the private haulers. Uh, you know, that's a, not something you necessarily think about unless you're in the business. Uh, the, the rest of the food system doesn't necessarily think of it that way. But everybody sends their stuff to the waste hauler, right? Um, to take to a transfer station and bury in a landfill or uh, potentially reuse if they're more uh, more advanced. And so I think it's interesting, John, that that puts uh, organizations like yours um, and private waste haulers in a position of having some significant influence uh, on closed loop food systems. I, I don't know that that was a result that, uh, it's one you know if you live it, right? Well, you know, if you live it and breathe it, you understand this process. And a lot of people don't realize the, the impact that we could have uh, as part of that value chain. It is a matter of if, if figuring out a way to maximize use of waste haulers and, and find a way to be more efficient and effective with that process. As people know, that's usually the problem 
when it comes to food waste or organics is, is the waste hauling side and the handling. And so if we can unlock and create a solution that makes it more efficient for others to divert it rather than just landfilling it, I think that's the waste haulers are going to be the one that's going to have to come up with a solution. Yeah, it's 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 really it's really uh, uh, fascinating their position to kind of coordinate different aspects of the whole network, um, and uh, uh, it really truly is a circular economy uh, application. It's the, it's the uh, biological nutrient cycle uh, as applied specifically to food systems. Um, but you know the compost goes in the soil, the food comes out, it goes through the value network, and all of the waste comes back to go back in the compost mm -hmm. again. And, and the waste haulers are in a great position to do that. The campus is in a great position to do that uh, for some or all of the valley. Um, and so we're very excited uh, about that as a next step, uh, next uh, project sometime in the next uh, year or so, actual demonstration of that. Um, so um, uh, those are a couple of examples of, uh, of um, uh, of projects that we're doing, and we choose those, I think, largely because um, uh, of the regional approach. Uh, one of the things I think that the circular economy folks have pointed out uh, is that uh, material management needs to be looked at from a regional perspective, not necessarily a jurisdictional perspective. So breaking down those jurisdictional walls, collaborating across, which you do, uh, but maximizing that sharing value um, those kinds of concepts are, are important to build closed loop circular systems on a region basis. And I think from the very beginning, John, uh, you didn't talk about this as a city of Phoenix municipal solid waste problem. Yeah, and, 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 that, and you saw on the slide earlier, the region's going to double in population. And we have 26 cities in this region, and so we have to think as a region if we're going to be successful and to help each other out and that's the only way this is going to work and and as you can see with some of these projects and these collaborations with other cities those silos are breaking down there are other cities are thinking about a region now not just about themselves because they know they need help from other cities so they can be successful in their waste issues and majority of the cities don't have landfills they don't have transfer stations and so majority of this material has got to be shipped miles away from that city. Us alone is 65 miles one way, and there's other cities that are farther. And so they see that in the future they can't sustain the current program they have. And so to be successful, we got to work together and collaborate. And to do that, we're going to be using Risen as part of that platform. So, you know, this is a, what we think we're still relatively unique at, uh, which is a major university and a major city and metropolitan area collaborating to do these kinds of things. Um, we certainly are seeing these kinds of models like the campus-based model mm -hmm. emerge in other places uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd be, we would be advocates for this uh, city-university kind of relationship uh, uh, to to do that kind of work mm -hmm. on a region-by-region region basis. So, um, we have a question. Uh, sure. Uh, the question is, what are the plans to apply these learnings to other cities? Well, <laughs> no, I'll take that one. Great, great. Um, as part of our RISEN program, we are in discussions with other cities. We've had discussions with Austin, Texas. We've had discussions with possibly with Orlando, Florida. I'm doing some Lake traveling County, Lake County in Indiana. Indiana. And I'm doing some traveling to different cities throughout the U.S talking about this program to get interest and again it's not for us it's we want them to create this type of a hub in their own city with their university so they can create a platform where they can share their solutions with others as well and that's what our our, our goal is as part of the other cities yeah there's a, and you know we by the way should uh, give some of those uh, cities uh, some props, you know. I mean, uh, for instance, Austin is doing a great job, mm -hmm. and they're they they have many of the same similar thoughts and initiatives, and are very advanced uh, in their thinking and practice. And there are other regions too. So that, uh, um, uh, we certainly think we're out there in the leading edge, especially with our collaboration. But it's good to see this kind of paradigm uh, emerging um, around the around the country and around the world. And with uh, with that, we can go to uh, uh, you know, just kind of summarize that the 
you know, the whole idea is to use this resource to beneficial use in a circular manner. Uh, we, ASU, uh, is uh, trying to propagate this globally. We have a hub in Guatemala that's in startup mode a hub in Lagos, Nigeria that's in uh, startup uh, mode. We're talking with similar efforts in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, we have several other conversations going on in the United States uh, and around the world. We just initiated some conversations in India, for instance, uh, in some of the Caucasus and the Balkans. Uh, we have some similar kinds of conversations going. So we hope to work with the circular economy uh, um, Ecosystem, Mel MacArthur Foundation, Racy Anderson, Closed Loop Fund, companies like Dell, uh, and and who with whom we have a great relationship, and others uh, to build this uh, paradigm out globally as a uh, as a um, uh, uh, a network of academics and practitioners that are focused on achieving circular economy results. With that. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Uh, yes, and then one thing I do want to say, and then back to, to Jules' question too, is you know uh, to getting the word out, and we are trying to do whatever, everything we can. I've done uh, the House of our caucus, recycling caucus, House of Representatives, has um, I did a presentation. So I've done presentation at the U.S. Capitol in our 23 cities locally. Know about this program and a part of us as well. Okay, so there is one more question here uh, from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So thank you for that. How much of this is closed loop activity is driven by natural momentum? And how much needs to be directly stimulated and promoted like at, from activities like RISM? That's a great question. Actually. Yeah, you want, you want to take a cut at that? I'll, I'll add a few things. Or? Yeah, the nat natural momentum. I think there was some natural momentum based on the, the mayor and council's uh, goal. And um, and some of them, you know, I think the natural momentum really started the RISM program. Yeah. And so, because as, as part of what we were thinking about and with the population and the growth here in the city of Phoenix, we know we couldn't sustain this program. So we had to come up with some solutions. And one of that solutions was RISM. And now that RISM is here, Risen has started to create and promote other activities based on the expertise that we have here at ASU and some of the expertise we have here in the city of Phoenix as well. Yeah, I would I would uh, uh, say from uh, kind of the other side um, that uh, uh, well, from the natural momentum side, you know, cities, uh, reg uh, urban regions, and corporations worldwide are wanting to do the right thing. Uh, they're wanting to do the right thing for their citizens and better environmental approaches, uh, better services, uh, and being just good global uh, citizens that take care of our resources. As sustainability has emerged in consciousness, the leaders uh, of major corporations and, and cities have uh, gotten uh, more aggressive about being a contributor to the solutions instead of uh, contributors to the problem. So there's natural momentum from that point of view. Uh, having said that, um, you know, it takes a lot of work to do things like collaborate across jurisdictional boundaries or look at something from a regional perspective or get out of the box where the easiest, cheapest thing to do is throw something in the landfill. Uh, and so it takes a lot of uh, intellectual work. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of collaboration, a lot of commitment uh, to uh, make these happen. So I think it's uh, probably a yin-yang balance kind of thing where there's both a natural momentum in the consciousness as well as uh, a lot of work to um, to uh, cause these things to happen. And now to add on to that too, Dan, is so, so people can get an idea here in Phoenix and the region, there's, there's some challenges here because look, land is cheap, landfilling is cheap, um, the environment here isn't where we don't regulate uh, or require people to do things. So everything we're doing here is all voluntary. And what we're trying to do is, is get our residents to change their behavior on a voluntary basis. So we're not going to legislate that you're, you're required to recycle, throw your organics into the organics material like they do in San Francisco, Seattle, Oregon's area. 
that that's not done here and so we have a different environment which is a bigger challenge but I think it's a challenge we are tackling and it's working and um, the environment is changing a little bit but still there is that challenge yeah and I said and and, and oh by the way uh, uh, one of the first questions out of a, a public officials uh, mouth is how does this pencil out you does know so money, does, yeah. does it save money or does this make money or does it create jobs you know they might be willing to spend a little bit more money on the expense side if it creates more jobs in the community but it's there's always an economic justification that's underlying uh, this work. While there may be fantastic sustainability benefits, social and economic, uh, socio-ecological benefits, greenhouse gas reduction, soil amendments, soil mm -hmm. health, carbon sequestration, all these potentially great benefits uh, from an environmental perspective and a social perspective, they're still, you know, the first question is about uh, economic viability and the business case for mm -hmm. it. So, uh, We've uh, focused on that from the get-go, and we'll continue to uh, uh, look at that. And by, by the way, that's uh, been a great value add by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, just to put in a shameless plug that the, the, the fact that they focused on the economic argument and the fact that they've done a lot of research in that area has been uh, uh, highly valuable in our messaging to, uh, to um, city officials uh, and uh, corporations, uh, not just in Phoenix, but around the world. And that was one of the main reasons why we chose the, to join the LNC 100 program is because of that process and and our, our council saw the value of that as well. And so it's, it's going to help us move our circular economy discussions forward as well as give us an if more information and, and provide more value to our program moving forward and down into the future. With that, any other questions? No more questions. All righty. Well, uh, yeah, with that, um, thank you, Dan, and thank you for those that are joining us here. And feel free to reach out to us if you want to create a hub like this in, in your area. We'd be happy to sit down with you and talk to you about what we, what, what it took to create that here and how the value that it is for the region. Um, and it's, I know these other cities here locally are seeing that value, Dan, and they're very excited about this regional discussion about resource management. And it's something that's going to play a big part in the success for this region for the future. Yeah, we should would, uh, say on the other, the flip side of that coin is we hunger to learn from from uh, you, <laughs> from everybody, you know. I mean, it's a these. This is a wicked problem of sustainability that is global in nature, and that we all have to pull on the same oar. So we have to share best practices and ideas and technologies, and uh, so we we look forward to learning from the whole global uh, community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, audience. And we will For you, either have a good morning or. Good evening. Yeah, good, good night. night. <laughs>